All right, and I think we are live. So, hey, this is Kenneth, and welcome to the Friday Night Shenanigans live stream. Uh, this is actually, I guess, three weeks in a row now that this has actually happened. But this time, I think we're actually going to come into this with a purpose. Is to oh, oh God, audio, stop, stop. All right, there we go. No audio there. Um, gosh, like I was saying, three weeks in a row. Uh, and so this time I think we're actually coming with a purpose. I think we're going to come in and we're going to try and design a hat for a beagle bone. Not a beagle bone black, not a beagle bone green, not a beagle bone blue. Like the legit old school beagle bones because that's kind of, that's when I gave beagle bone a fair shot before kind of deciding that it was a platform that really wasn't going to gain dominance. Um, but this is also going to be the first time that I've, uh, taken a shot at KiCad on Windows, so that's going to be a little bit painful. We'll see how that goes, but, um, other than that, things are going well. Um, so let's get into it. <clears throat> I got one, one viewer so far. I assume that's, that's you, Jeff, in the chat room. Ah, two viewers. Excellent. We've got people showing up. So that's reassuring because no one was showing up. And that was going to be sad. It was just me hanging out. Uh, checking the promos. Um, all right. So tonight, Bone Hat. So this is going to go in a couple stages. Um, Kind of the let's open up a note see a notepad I guess since I'm doing this as a quick thing um, we're not gonna make sort of compositing or anything which is gonna be a bit unfortunate um, so let's see if I can figure out how to screen share this screen all right so we're designing a beagle bone cape uh, beagle bone beagles call them capes uh, Raspberry Pi's calls them hats. Arduino's call them shields. Launchpads call them boosters. Everyone likes to brand their, you know, expansion card. But pretty much what we're looking for on this is we want to be able to take, you know, 12 to 24 volt power in. And what I'm wanting to be able to do with this is actually use this as a console server. Um, if you've ever worked on like router equipment or server equipment, you'll know that they actually will tend to have serial consoles on them, which are nice things to be able to reach remotely. The issue with console servers is that they are like $200 a port. And so I, I'm, I have a project where I kind of need about four, four serial ports on it. Um, and a normal console server for that would run me about $800. And the used ones aren't that much cheaper. I have some like single port console servers that have no authentication, but I want something a little bit more, uh, like I want to be able to SSH into some sort of device and have high confidence that it's going to be up to date and that then whatever we, I SSH into it can be secured. And then from there I can, uh, actually interact with these serial consoles, right? And so I figured that the BeagleBone running pure Debian is going to be something that I can keep relatively up to date and secure. The BeagleBone has four serial ports straight on the IO headers for it, which is perfect. And then I can just use something standard like Minicom over SSH to interact with these consoles. So I mean, I think it's it's going to be relatively straightforward, but the serial ports on it are 3.3 volt TTL. And so we're going to need to translate that up to RS-232. So that's the plan.
There we go. All right. So uh, the first thing we need to do is we need to figure out where the serial ports are on the vehicle bone and need to figure out how to interact with the vehicle bone to get them working. I, I don't even know if all four of them work by default. So let's pull a... Since like I may have started this live stream too early on a Friday, I think people are maybe still having dinner or still getting home. See so how I currently see myself as having no viewers. So apparently there's no one available at the moment to watch me screw around on a Friday evening. Eagle bone pin out. So let's see. So we're asking what the beagle bone pinout is. Um, I don't know. Let's pick some random site and visit it. Beagle bone. Classic beagle bone. Two. All right. Getting started. Bone 101, that seems like a reasonable page to start on. Nope. There we go. All right. So, the, the Cape expansion. So, we've got P9 on the left, P8 on the right. And in there, we've got the digital grounds. Five volts. We're going to want the one of these two five volts. I'm not sure which one. Um, one of those is going to be the five volt in that we're going to want to regulate the 12 volts down to. And then what we're looking for is these UARTs UART four, UART one. Uh, ch -ch -ch -ch. More than those two. Right, and this is what I'm concerned about is I think some of them are multiplexed across. Uh, ah, here we go. All right. Yeah, UART4, UART1, TX, and RX. All right, and then you can see also here that UART1 has flow control. And then we're looking for UART4, 4, 1, 3, TX, T5, All right, so there's, there's UART 5, I think is 37, 38. UART 3 only has a transmit line there. Okay, yeah, so I think we got UART 1 here. I think we got UART 2, TX, RX there. We've got UART 4 TX RX there. And then I think we've got UART 5. Well, there's a typo in their figure. Um, UART 5 TX RX there. So I think that's, that's what we get. So grabbing our notepad here, just kind of work on specs. Um, we've got UART 1, 2, four and five. One is on, let's do TXRX, so that's gonna be uh, P924. And P9, uh, 26. Your two is, P9, 21, P9, 22. UART 4 is P9, 13, P9, 11. And UART 5, I think, is UART 5, or so that's going to be P8. 
P8 on 37, P8, 38. I'm hoping that these somehow show up uh, in Linux just as uh, dev TTY S0, S1, S2, stuff like that. So we're going to want to validate that as well. All right, then I guess we we want to know about the power as well. Uh, so we're looking for someone that explains the power pins. Power management from Elex. Elex usually has good hardware info. To do. Well, that's encouraging. That really just doesn't bode well at all, does it? Okay, so it's, we're not looking for something that advanced. We're literally just looking for. Some info about so VDD five volts is the main power supply from the DC input jack. VDD five volts. Mm-hmm. <laughs> VDD five volts. All right, so that's five and six. Yeah, so the system five volt. I think that's after the power management system, and so we're interested in five and six on the input. And then if we were running something, it would be on seven and eight, maybe. But I don't think I really care that much. So I think we may just power all of our cape stuff straight off of the VDD five volt. So, all right, so BDD five volt power in. So we power out from the cape. P9, five, P9, six. That's what we got there. Um, All right. So we, we figured out the pinout here. And so what we're trying to do is we're trying to design the cape to plug on top of this so that we can have essentially like Cisco style console ports on it for the four serial ports from the Beagle Bone. Um, so that, that way I can just use like an ethernet cable, plug it into one of these jacks, string it over, plug it into my Cisco switch or my Cisco router or something, anything that I've got um, that I need a serial port for, um, and then talk to it from the bone with nice cabling, RS-232, all that sort of stuff. And I don't have to pay $800 for the console server, right? So that's what we're working on for those of you that are dropping in a little bit later. So my theory is that I think that the four serial ports are on pins 24, 26, 21, 22, 13, 11, and then P8, 37, 38. So that's what I think at this point. But before I start doing schematic capture, what I want to do is validate that I got those right. And so um, what we're going to do first is power up the beagle bone, log into it, fire up Minicom, and then uh, try and type on the serial port and then bridge the tr transit line back to the receive line and see if the text starts showing up on the other side, right? Well, the same side, right? Whatever I type in starts echoing back because the like a single straight wire 
effectively acts as a loop back on it. So that's the hope. I'm not sure. Jeff, are you still are you still there in the chat room? Because it seems like there may be something wrong with the stream. Anyways, to validate it, we're gonna got USB cable to power it up, and then plug it into my network, and I should hopefully be able to SSH. Okay, cool. So Jeff's alive. So Jeff at least is here. Um, cool. Is it? The way that the viewers were dropping in and out, it was kind of got me a little concerned that, like, I didn't have any audio or something. So, all right, so we're gonna get all that shuffled around. Get that shuffled around. Stream seems fine, really, because like it's it's oscillating between it's saying that I have zero viewers and one viewer. So I think something's going. Special night. All right. So, anyways, phone, Ethernet, and then power. So, ready, set, go. And the phone powers up. Great. All right. So, let's fire up Buddy. Now what we're going to want this to like when I resize it so let's share screen two so I want this so we're going to log into Kenneth at KWF Bone 1, but I want the window change the size of font when the window is resized. Yeah. So let's give that Beagle Bone a chance to finish booting. And then we're going to press it go. Nope. Host does not exist. All right. Let's open a command prompt. See, okay, yeah, so it is up. So now I should be able to start putty session and log into it. Oh, I probably have to do a fully qualified domain name because my DNS isn't quite right. Window, change the size of the font, open. Do I want to accept the server key? Yes. And we're in like Flynn. All right. Cool, so there we go. So here we are, logged into the bone. I don't think that I... I don't think that I've got Minicom installed Yeah, So we're gonna have to install Minicom. Have to install Minicom. All right, take go. Yes, I wanna install those. All right, so we're now installing uh, Minicom, which is like a cert it's essentially like hyper terminal in Windows, but for Linux, um, so that we can validate these pinouts that we've got um, right here as far as serial ports one, two, four, and five being on specific pins. So that's the hope. All right. So, um, of course, like always, uh, in the chat, feel free to talk about what you're working tonight. It's Friday night, so uh, we're all working on something. 
and looks like Jeremy is online. Wish I could make it tonight. Jeremy is not making it tonight. So that's all. Give me a hard time on Twitter. Um, but anyways, so we want to validate those, right? So at this point, um, if I do an ls dev tty-s, we've got 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. I'm really hoping if we're lucky, uh, Jeffrey is not setting up a 3D printer because UPS. Yes. Um, so... The hope and, hope and desire is that you are one in the pinout diagram says TTY S1 uh, on the dev file system. That's really the hope. Um, I My theory is that I think S0 is the USB interface. Um, so that's, uh, so the USB interface uh, console into the computer is there. And then these are going to be on the headers. So in theory, if I talk to Minicom, cannot open dev mode. All right. Well, all right. Let's forget that. All right. So we want to say that our serial device is going to be uh, dev tty s1. Um, I'm going to rather my default be 9600 baud. Uh, we don't need any sort of flow control. So main thing here is like when I, when I want to edit a, uh, you know, field A, I'm typing A. It pops up to the, the up here, and I can say S1. Um, main thing is I want zero port here to be set right. We want the baud rate to be the right. We don't want any flow control. That's it. Um, we will save that as the default. We'll exit. All right. So right now we we're in a serial console on the BeagleBone, which is conceivably on port one, which I now realize I probably should have saved, probably should have saved the uh, pin out here. Like so. Um, that's not very useful, but you get the point. So we think that pins 24 and 26 are your ones. So that's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12th one down. So Right now, if I type here, you don't see anything. And that's to be expected. And so my theory is that if I can take a piece of wire, which I, I have in my hand, which you can't see, and I were to plug it into 12 down and 13 down on that row, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. I were to plug that in. So that wire doesn't fit. Twelve down. Thirteen down. So with those bridge is essentially like a loop back. Still nothing. <sighs> Point four, right? So two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve, fourteen, sixteen, eighteen, twenty, twenty-two, twenty-four, twenty-six. All right. So what if we were to instead try like TTYS zero? Uh, 
doesn't work either. All right, so now we're out and fishing for, is there some stupid multiplex thing that I needed to do instead? Uh, Beagle bone header serial port. <laughs> okay. Ah, enabling UART on BeagleBone Black. That sounds promising. I'm having trouble getting the UART enabled. I've gone through many of those up, blah. <laughs> Seriously? All right, so looks like we need to edit this ETC default cape manager. All right, so ETC default. So ETC default is kind of a fun place that is kind of uh, like these files in ETC default tend to be ones that are for kind of like your first pass settings for uh, daemons that run on here. So like if we look at the SSH one, um, you'll see that it says pretty much path to SSHD, no options, right, which is reasonable. Or if we were to, I don't know, cron have an interesting one, right? So like this is like, you know, sets the environment variable, you know, read environment equals yes, um, and that's it. So relatively useful place to look for initial switches, except that it doesn't even look like the file that we're looking for is in there, um, which is not, Reassuring. All right. Are you freaking kidding me? I'm starting to get concerned that I have to compile something. It is sys devices. Uh, for those of you that are just dropping in, we're trying to figure out how to use a UART on a BeagleBone platform uh, so that I can use it as a, essentially a console server Platform Bone Cape Manager. Bone Bone Cape. Oh, okay. Uh, 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 it's there. Slots. What does this give me? Nothing. I don't know what that's supposed to mean. Uh, da -da 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 -da. So the fact that this Default doesn't exist. Cape manager. Is it literally just going to be an empty, like a minuscule file with one thing in it? ETC default, sudo vim, it's a brand new cape mgr file. I don't have vim. All right. It's like I just spun up this Debian install last night or something. Da, 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 da. All right, so as we sit here and watch this, uh, by all means, people sound out in the comments or the chat, I guess, for uh, what you're working on tonight. It's uh, Friday night shenanigans, hanging out, dorking around. Sadly, um, unless the chat room riots 
particularly loudly. Uh, this is not going to be a repeat of the last two weeks of Kenneth builds a cable. I wasn't planning on building any audio interface cables today. I felt that uh, successfully achieving one of those was enough for the month of October. But we're sitting here watch, watching an SD card crawl along. So exciting. So good. <laughs> wait, 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 what is this? TTYO? That doesn't bode well. What TTYO do I have going on? Nothing. Okay. So, yeah, so let's do Kate MGR. New file that we want to say Kate equals BB UR1 BB. Art two and reboot. All right, I give uh, many dislikes in my videos, dislikes, views. All right, so do shut down, restart now. Goodbye. Okay, all right, so we're gonna let that reboot for a second. So, again, this is gonna be uh particularly exciting live stream tonight because there's going to be a lot of dead air as we sit here and watch a beagle bone crawl along at the speed of a beagle bone. But we're still at this point in the validation phase. Let's see. Come on. Stop. All right. So at this point, we're still in the validation phase of building a cape on top of this so that we can have essentially for 8P8C or RJ45 connectors as RS-232 serial ports, right? So I'm, I'm doing this because I've got a couple pieces of Cisco equipment that I want to be able to talk to remotely, um, and their consoles, their serial ports aren't DB, uh, DSEP9 like everyone expects, uh, but is 8P8C, and so I want to build this into a console server so I can plug a uh, Ethernet cable straight between the two of them, right? But before I start doing board layout and schematic capture, I want to make sure that I can A, get the UARTs actually working on these Beagle Bones, and B, I can then actually get the right pins for those UARTs on the Beagle Bone. So that's what we're validating at the moment. So let's switch back to screen two. Let's try and restart the session. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. All right, so in theory, if we were to LS dev, we would now see a TTY O zero. We don't. All right. What if we were to minicom? My S one. All right. So that's not right. Zero. That's not right. And that's not right.
actually a little bit pretty well stumped here. So that's not the case anymore. Picklebone, Debian, UART, enable. What does that give me? Enable all UARTs at boot. That sounds like a good thing. Previously, we enabled the UART by hand. Yes, so that sounds right, right? We've got one and two and four and five. That's what we're looking for. Ah, da, 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 da. So let's try that. So let's pick up a shell. Let's echo BB UART one into the sys devices your bone. Platform. Bone Kate Manager. Lots. So even even this guy doesn't have. You know, it's right there. And really, this is the part that frustrates me about single board computers, particularly ones, no, really all of them. Um, all single board computers really tend to have this real problem that they change their hardware paradigm between Linux and the real world quite a bit. And then you just start going off the rails because it's like, uh, at this point, uh, there's a dozen bad tutorials out there on how to interact with this stuff. <sighs> okay, so and what about so this Kate manager clearly didn't work. So what about editing the boot environment? That file doesn't even exist. I mean, Jesus. Uh, which for Debian is located in boot U boots DTBS, another Okay, so that clearly is out of date. Oh, man. So I honestly don't know where I'm going at this point. Oh, boot. All right, so boot, you boot, boot. There we go. Lordy. Okay. So now let's edit that UM. 
kind of said, let's edit. Edit that. You um, and we. What do we want to do? We want to keep enable those. Hello. I said copy, paste. Edit paste. How do I feel like an idiot? Tape manager dot enable part number equals BB UART one. Let's just do start with one. Not because or two. All right. And we've restarted. All right, so at this point, I think we've got the boot config for this uh, BeagleBone set up so that I think it's going to come back, and I think we'll at least get two of the actual hardware serial ports. Once we get those, we're going to validate that my pinout's correct, and then we'll actually start doing the board layout because presumably that's what, that's what you guys actually came for, not me flutzing around in embedded Linux. <laughs> okay, now we really hope that we see a TTY. We don't. Unless I'm totally missing something here. Kate manager dot enable part number equals BBUART one BBUART two. Okay, so here's a theory. Maybe we've enabled it, but it's still the TTYS, right? So that maybe that's maybe that's the deal here. So we should have seen something there. All right, well, so hmm. it's dumped. And this is why this is one of the many reasons why I absolutely hate working on these platforms. Um, because it's just it's just bad.
Yeah, my pinup's right. I got the right, got the right wires put together. Man, this guy's doing exactly what I want, except that my UR doesn't work. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Okay. So we've got a lot of bone kernels maybe we really do need to install a uh, custom kernel What have we got right now? We're currently in four four ninety one. So I think we probably want something like this. This is getting all that much more horrific. Now I'm still on a custom kernel. Wow. And all this just to validate that I can talk on the serial ports on a BeagleBone. Right, yeah, right? Like we're, we're getting farther out in the weeds here and I'm really quite unhappy. Because um, the alternative here was that I actually don't necessarily use a BeagleBone at all um, and I instead use something like an FTDI chip, right? Because if we look on FTDI's website, uh, like we're all used to like using like the FTDI um, 232R, um, or like H, right? Um, yeah. Uh, they also have a two, uh, 422, this one, or four, what four two three two H. Um, this chip is a four port UART, right? And so we could actually um, pretty much just build a purpose built USB serial adapter that has four UARTs, four RS two thirty two translators, and then four RJ forty five or AP eight C connectors on it. Um, and build everything, set everything up exactly how we want it, um, except we're no longer tied to the beagle bone, and we can instead drop this on whatever, plug this into whatever piece of hardware we want. Um, So I think I'm gonna give I think I'm gonna give this beagle bone about another ten minutes before we jump ship and we start working on other solutions here. So I think we're working off of this one at this point. Yeah, right. So then it's just a question of how do I want to mount it? 
because the the plan here is we're going to have this go on din rail uh and so then the question then is how do i mount it on din rail which may just be as bad as i custom model some din clip you know clip mouse for it and go from there and then i can make the board exactly the size i want it um, it'll be a micro usb so you can plug it into anything Start the bone again. Hope you guys are enjoying watching me restart Beagle Bones tonight. It's really going to be pretty disappointing. Plus, I was kind of looking forward to <laughs> yes, yes, thank you. Um, I really was kind of looking forward to finally putting some my my beagle bones to some use because I have like three or four of these beagle bone whites that I just have not been able to find any use for because it's such a weird platform that has lost so much community support. Um, so I was really kind of looking forward to being able to sit here and actually put them to use on something. Survey says. not there I mean I I know that I'm not following their whole guide here <laughs> All right, just to humor him. Let's clone this repository and then see what goes on there. I think it's going to be cute. Okay, well, hmm. so in any case, we're going to need some sort of RS-232 adapter. So let me grab my box. DID controllers, diodes, transistor displays. Digital RF RS232 power cables. Nope. Box isn't there. Digital ICs. Okay, so get clone. 
HTTPS github.com slash Robert C. Nelson bb.org overlays. All right, but so regardless of what happens there, um, we're still going to need to decide on what the actual front end of this thing is going to look like. And so I've got this wonderful bag. Oh, sorry. So I pulled the box digital ICs. In that, I've got a bag called transceivers. And I believe in here, I've got whatever um, RS-232 transceivers I happen to have on hand at the moment. So we're going to start digging through here, seeing what I have. And if any of that stuff jumps out at us versus just specking out, you know, cold, uh, let's just use the standard max 232. So we've got a max 3222. That's TSA. up. Nope. I've got a couple max 3233s. Looks like at least two of them. Three of them. Kind of like that one. That sounds like a winner. Saying 3.3 volts on it. I don't know what that means. Hopefully it doesn't mean that this is only 3.3. Uh, we don't want DTMF. We don't want RFID. We don't want DTMF. We don't want Ethernet. Some of those are all right. I hope no one's too brokenhearted here, hoping that, you know, this stream was going to be an exciting start. This is usually how the beginning of projects start, is it's a real slow, figure out what in the world I'm doing, and then go from there. I would have thought I had more RS-232 stuff than that. OK, so let's assume that we want to go with the max 32, 33. So we're going to be max 32, 33. Survey says interface, automatic shutdown, wake up features, high data rate, blah, 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 blah. Uh, so it's only 3.3 volts. Okay. So we've got a receive out, TX in, TX in, receive out, force on. I think we're just going to strap those in a certain location. Hmm, T out, T out, R out, or R in. Dur, 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 are in. We got some capacitors. We got some force off. All right, so we're gonna need to. We have to be careful with how we strapped those uh, control lines to make it so that they all all cooperate. This is a little bit, you know, wasn't really so interested in trying to go low power or something. But in any case. Yeah. God, this just sucks. Hmm. <sighs> OK. 
Okay, clone there, change to that. Let's just play along. feel like I still haven't found the right tutorial here. Mm -hmm. See, now this one is slightly different. And this UM so if we change to boot U boot boot and we edit this UM file. They seem to imply that it's without the cape enable thing. No, because that's that's a um, environment variable set there. Jesus. I think I can hear it say cape manager enable part number equals EB UART two. Anybody even comment? No, I don't think I want to comment that part out. I think optarg is just another another variable there. So I think I've just moved it around, really. I don't think this has changed anything. So that's another one. And how much of this is maybe because I'm on stretch? Is that, what are the chances that that's just screwing me? How old is this post? Asked two years ago. This answer I mean, what's the chances that it could have changed up in like the last eighteen months? Well, I mean, I think I already tried this cape thing. But maybe it wasn't with the new kernel. I mean, this is this is to get, get just getting ridiculous at this point, really, though. 
So, I mean, it's one of the things I think if this doesn't work, um, we're just going to, I mean, I don't know, like this thing probably is pretty interesting. Hey, David. So the, the what I'm trying to do tonight is I'm trying to design a console server hat for a beagle bone um, so that I can have four the ser four serial ports on the beagle bone come out as RS-232 ports so I can talk to other devices remotely. Um, everyone else should also sound out in the chat with what they're doing. Um, but at the moment, we're fighting the fact that documentation for BeagleBone sucks, and I have no idea how to enable a UART on it. All right, so LS. Dev. Survey says. Oh, no. All right, so it just might luck that the beagle bone white is different than the black. Ugh. This was gonna be so cute. Ah, bit X40 player. Yep. You know. The hundred dollars for a Heiko iron was something that hurt a little bit right up until the moment that I finally got one and realized that a hundred bucks on a hundred bucks on a soldering iron was a hundred bucks I hadn't spent soon enough. Is there a config pin command? No. Oh wait, except the Wow, seventy-nine dollars, even better. Um, so, I actually was on waffling about whether to get my iron or not. Right when the eight 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 came out to replace the nine thirty six, I took one look at the eight 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 and went, "Hell no, I don't want a Saturn iron that looks like it's from uh, Toys R Us," and rushed to buy one of the last ones that was supposed to be available of the nine thirty six. Uh, I actually bought it from Adafruit, um, but then I think the 936 didn't really go away so much as people expected it to. <sighs> yeah, so that's the same one I was looking at before. Yeah. And this is just amazing. All right, so that was really old. Okay, let's see. So we want Twitter. Uh, we 
one w four w w w Ryan. Hey, look at that. Look at that Toys R Us soldering iron. Yeah. All right. Well, so I think we just about need to admit defeat here on this one. Um, so I've now spent an hour trying to get this beagle bone to cooperate and I can't, I can't get the UARTs to come up on it. Uh, it. It's one of these things that it might be pretty obvious once I finally get the exact right guide for it. Cause it's going to like, we're talking about changing one config file somewhere with two lines, like running some command. Um, but the community, like they've, they've changed it so many times and the community is just so in, uncohesive. I don't even know where to look. Um, but so what the plan was, was I was going to have a piece of DIN rail available and then the beagle bone was going to have the, the cape on top of it that had the four, you know, serial ports as RJ45. So it was going to be a straight ethernet cable point to point. Um, and then I actually managed to find on Thingiverse the super cute uh, DIN rail mount for the beagle bone. Let's see, here's my M3 hardware uh, that screw onto the four mounting holes on the bone and then snap onto it. All right, so that was supposed to be the idea. All right, and so concept here being, I don't even know which way I want to put this. Oh, and this takes a uh, socket. Mm. That's an English socket. Well, this is a bit awkward. Anyone know off the top of their head uh, if uh, any English sockets are good enough for M3? Close enough. Which, another thing that I found out, which is kind of incredible um, about the... Beaglebone, the four mounting holes aren't on a rectangle. It's actually like a trapezoid. So you'll notice the the two the two pieces I printed actually have to have the holes in different places. Well, that's, I mean, that's not fair, but it's in a different orientation. I picked the Beaglebone instead of the Raspberry Pi because the Beaglebone has four serial ports on it. I think I think the, the Raspberry Pi only has one UART, and I think by default it's captured, so you have to release it anyways. And I was like, dude, like the, the Beagle Bones got like four UARTs right there on the headers. Um all right, and back when I was doing promotion, like doing like community promos for the Beagle Bone, like my whole big thing for it was, yeah, these things have great IO. Like you don't need uh any sort of like breakout chips or anything like you can just wire it straight up that was the whole argument all right so eh, eh. if I sit here and manage to get this screw in I really hope that this is, I mean, this is really a high quality television right here. You guys n watching me out of screen, screwing around with some hardware. This is not working as I hoped. Come on, come on. And last screw. Come 
right? And for Raspberry Pis, I do actually have a pretty good DIN DIN rail solution. Is there's the the dinner plates on Amazon that I actually like. I've I've bought like nine of those things now um, to mount Raspberry Pis on DIN rails, and they're great. Um, you can't snap them onto it, which kind of sucks a bit, but um, I was real happy with the dinner plate as a concept. So with that there, we can then conceivably, oh, oh, come on, board, there we go. Snap it on like that. Right, so it's gonna be this, board that plugs into it, and we're off to go. So now the question is, was I not so wed to this idea that I'd be willing to instead make this a serial board that maybe has nothing to do with the bone at all at this point? Because, I, I mean, I don't need it to be the beagle bone. But some sort of serial adapter. And at this point, we're really just making a USB serial adapter, which... Honestly, at some point, you just go, I can buy four $3 USB serial adapters. Ah, oh, shit, I really could. Um, yeah, because two of the systems I want to talk to have D sub nines, and two of the systems I want to talk to have APHC connectors on them. I have Cisco D sub to APHC cables. Um, and that's just uh, like and that's just a standard USB serial adapter, um, and then it's just a USB serial adapter with console. Why why couldn't you use the GPIO pins and the Raspberry Pi and send them into a UART chip? Because I didn't feel like I needed to have to implement like a discrete UART chip and talk to it. All right, and we're implementing four of them. So like trying to implement a whole UART talking over GPIO is just redundant. Particularly when something like, you know, the FTDI 4232 over USB can give me four UARTs, right? And so at some point I'm no longer using like to use the GPIO pins on the Raspberry Pi to try and talk to UART chips to try and support four UARTs is no simpler or cleaner than just getting USB serial adapters. And if I'm gonna build this custom bespoke serial adapter, it doesn't have that big of an advantage over just standard Jelly Bean $3 eBay serial adapters, except that I might trust it a little bit more. But these things are really meant as like a get out of jail free card so I don't have to drive across town maybe if I really screw up, right? Because in the ideal case, you never need console access to a device. You just log into it over SSH. All right, so at this point, I have a couple options. I can either drop in a Raspberry Pi, which already has four USB ports even, plug four USB serial adapters into it, and then um, four, you know, four USB serial adapters into it, and then four cables. Um, or I go with the FTDI thing and make it super clean. All right, let's ask this question from David. Why do you need serial? Why not USB? Um, well, because the devices I'm talking to are serial right like this is a this is a router that has a APHC console on it which is you know 9600 baud rs232 um and i mean it's so yeah like it's it's going to have to be usb on the parent side like on the single board computer side uh to talk to something Right, so at this point, I'm trying to talk, convince myself that it's worth me going through all this trouble just to make a slightly nicer and cleaner RS-232 adapter. 
right? Because like we we have now ventured away from super clean hat cape for the beagle bone to trying to replace a commodity product. <laughs> yes, rollover cables um, are always useful for this sort of thing. Because what? I'll have a Raspberry Pi. I need to power the Raspberry Pi somehow. I don't know how to do that either. I thought serial was outdated. You know, people keep saying that RS-232 serial is outdated, but um, serial is one of those things that is the lowest common denominator and tends to be very noise resistant. Um, in RF environments like hilltop digipeters, I avoid USB as much as I can because I've gotten tired of every once in a while, if you get RF into a room, it'll take out USB links. Um, and RS-232 is much more noise resilient, right? And so I've, I've had TN like TNCs that support both RS-232 and USB. I will always go for RS-232 on them. Um, and in this case, yes, I'm actually, I'm, I'm talking to a, uh, kind of the one I'm most concerned about is I'm actually, I'm talking to a Catalyst 6506 router. So this is an old Cisco router that, I mean, you know, USB just wasn't, isn't a thing on it. Like the supervisor cards have console ports and that's it. Um, I guess on some of the newer Cisco gear, yeah, like they have a USB console connector as well as the RS-232 one, but, you know, and then the, like for the servers I want to talk to, uh, I mean, the it's a computer that I want to be able to console into without being able to depend on its any network connectivity or anything. So, I mean, I don't even really know how you would do that, like have a single board computer try and talk to a, you know, x86 server, not over the network other than an RS-232 cable. Um, as you hold problematic. Hmm. All right, well, let's check all of the Twitter stuff. Cool. What? I could I could make this as a little little daughter card, design a 3D printed DIN mount for it. I mean, without any sort of architecture pressure, I probably would go with the Raspberry Pi, which is an operating system real I'm real comfortable with and I use a lot. Um, I have, yeah, I mean, I have FT, FT232Rs, I've got a lot of those already, but that'd just be stupid at this point because it's like I'd have four of them. Um, so yeah, I think we might actually just try and do it with this FT4232H chip because it's what, in a 64 pin LQFP. I can start with that. All right. All right, it's a new plan. Um, forget you, BeagleBone. We've got that. So we want to have, all right, I think we forget all that. I think we forget that. I think we forget that. I think we're actually, we're literally, oh man, we even, our product name isn't even right. New project. New folder. I mean, what are we even going to call this at this point? This is like a uh, quad console after. All right. So my thought was that we would be using something like this. 
We then want it to talk to, hmm, oh, these are 3.3 volt. I don't know. This probably has a 3.3 uh, volt regulator on it. All right. So we've got one of these. We've got two of these going to four serial ports. Um, one, two of those. We then just need a serial connector and Uh, sir, uh, yeah, I think that's about it. All right, I mean, this is this just got real simple, didn't it? So I guess one thing we do want to do is we want to make sure that we can source these, right? So before I jump in bed with this FT four two three two chip, I want to see what we're looking like for actually getting it. Interface controllers. Um, given the choice, I think I definitely want this in the QFP package. Just because it's you know got actual pins on it, I only want maybe ten of them. Boo, eight dollars! Wow, FTDI, man, you like to charge a lot of money for your parts. Okay, cool. So we can source it. Looking at the data sheet. Uh, look at the data sheet. We want to make sure that there's a 3.3 volt regulator out on it. Although I guess I, we really probably don't care that much. BCC, really? Because um, like I know that on the FT232R, um, it has a regulator internal to it. But this one doesn't V-reg in, V-reg out. Okay. Yeah, that actually does look correct. All right, so the main thing is um, we can actually use this regulator, the, the regulator on here. No, 50 and 49. Hello, where is it? No, that's a 3.3 .3 to 1.8. Hmm. All right, well, we can support full, full flow control, not that we actually want to. What's the typical applications for this look like? All right, so now I'm looking for, I wanna see a typical application where this actually is hooked up to a serial port. Um, and yeah, they, they use an external LDO. And that's fine. We can do that. I guess that's probably a little bit less stressful than even. They probably have a max two thirty two forty one. Yeah, yeah. So we're going to be using that too. All right, all right. These are all going to be okay. Um, we don't need an EEPROM because we don't really care about making this thing distinctive. We're, we're going to be perfectly happy with whatever the default uh, serial numbers and stuff are on it. Uh, yeah, so there. Yeah, so we just want to copy this, I guess. Dual RS232 interface. So all four channels is blah, 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 but only channels A and C are shown for clarity. Fantastic. 
Yeah, so if we wanted 422, we could also do that, but we do not. Because what they do, yeah, TXD enable. All right, all right, all right. Cool, so I think the first point of order is we actually need to create the part. And what, the, excuse me. Um, unless the library already happens to have it. Uh, let's see. Let's go on the PCB. No, we don't want the PCB. Stop. No, God, it's wrong. Schematic. All right, so we're just going to start throwing down parts. Um, once we get all the parts that we actually need, we'll start actually uh, getting closer. I'm going to guess that by default, FTDI isn't even. Yeah, right. Like there's a FTDI library that isn't actually included in the libraries by default. And this is something that sucks about FTDI. Program files, key catcher, all right. If I want to add from here, I'm hoping there's an FTDI library open. Yeah. All right, so now what happens when I try to add one? FTDI, lots and lots of parts. Four two. Oh, look at that! Look at that! Boom! Done. Okay, so that was a little bit easy. Um, I mean, if we're really lucky, because what we're gonna need a. Uh, Q, QFP something. All right, so we're L QFP 64. And the main thing is I always like to check the pitch, which is a lowercase e here. So we got a pitch. Brr, half millimeter. I'm that hurts. All right, well, tell you what, let's so. It's going to kind of seem like I'm jumping around here, but really, what I'm doing more than anything else is uh, um, validating stuff early so that it's really easy. Um, all right, so like I'm validating, all right, we already have this FT4232 part. I wanna check to make sure that I've got the LQFP64 pitch. Right, so I think that's the one that we want there. All right, so the main thing is we're comparing uh, LQFP 64, 10 by 10 millimeters, pitch 0.5. And we're comparing that against this data sheet that probably this D1 dimension is hopefully going to be 10. Right, so yeah, that's the right footprint right there. Fantastic. All right, so we've got that. We're going to need a serial port there. All right, so there's there's our serial port talking to um, the FTDI chip. We're going to need a power rail. 
So this is so USB in is going to be five volts, and then we need some sort of uh, voltage regulator somewhere to take that five volts and make it the three point three that we need actually need here. Um, I like to use eleven seventeen. One of my personal favorite. Oh, one amp. One amp's going to be plenty. All right, because we've now gotten rid of the whole single board computer on this. At best, the single board computer is going to be actually powering this board. Um, so USB is only going to be able to provide like half an amp anyways. The only thing that's pro, uh, powering is uh, this FTDI chip plus two level translators. So we've got a real nice low load. I could probably find something in SOT23 or something, but I don't think we're going to be hard up for space here. That symbol kind of sucks. Yeah, well. It's kind of just kind of big and chunky. That's just not very appealing. Um, and a fun thing about the 1117 symbols in KiCad is that they actually fail the electrical design rule check all on their own. Um, just because they're not, um, they they like put the fourth pin on top of the first pin and then set them both as power, and so it actually it violate no, no I guess it's a V out because two uh, two is the middle pin and four is the tab, uh, and this is what on like the SOT two two three package, uh, it they set them both as power output which isn't allowed because you can't have two power outputs powering the same net, so. Um, hooray. So we're going to take that 5 volts into here. We're going to add a capacitor there. We're going to add a ground uh, here and here. All right, so there's our wiring there. And then this right here, this is the 3.3 volts. So we want another VNet that's going to be 3.3. We're going to want another capacitor. Ground. And then we start wiring these up. So this is where we want to go back to this data sheet for a typical application. I don't know, the simple one. I'm going to go with the simple one. OK, so we so we've got a lot of filtering from 3.3 volts to that V phi and V phase lock loop. It's a little bit concerning, right? I mean, they seem really hesitant there. Oh, we do have some actual loads over there, though. All right, tell you what, we're just going to keep copying them. Do 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 do. OK, so there's our three in. This is going to run down to there. So that's our VREG in. So the VCCIO here, those all want to go to 3.3 volts. So there's those. Um, We then, tell you what, I'm going to pull this off screen so I can focus on this part here for everyone else. Um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, 
So we then have these three wires, pins here, coming down to that V regulator. I want to make sure I can see the chat. So all you guys can start chime in if stuff starts going silly or sideways. Okay, all right, so now we're, we're back here. All right, so, boom, boom. V, phi, there, and this is where we've got all this filtering. So we think that we want to add from 3.3 volts to these two, like they've got two capacitors that are something big and uh, they've got like a uh, 4.7 microfarad and a 100 nanofarads. So they've clearly want us to be pretty well filtered on this. All right, so we got those four. And then we're going to add a ferrite bead, and a you know, reasonable symbol with unreasonable uh value text oh not even that i don't even think i want to feel value just yeah um space i don't know l i just i want a field value of l maybe sure just Ferrite beads are essentially little little ferrite chips that don't, uh, at DC, they ideally have a resistance of zero. And then if you're higher frequency noises, um, start picking up a resistance in like 100 ohm to K ohm range. Uh, and so I think, for, but I don't really know which ferrite bead I'm gonna drop on there, whichever one it is, which I don't really think I care. Um, it's going to be like, you know, Like as the, the value for it's a bit hard, right? Because it's like, we're not interested in it as far as it being an inductance. The in resistance of like the impedance of it changes with frequency. So it's not like I can say that it's, it's a hundred, it's a hundred ohm ferrite bead. Cause it's like typically you'll say, like, yeah, at one megahertz or at, you know, 10, a hundred megahertz or something, it has an impedance of a hundred meg. So we're not, you know, that, that sort of thing is a little bit abstract there. And I don't know. We're going to do something silly like that. Copy component. Wire that up like this. And there we go. We got the power done. All right. And we've got that's going to be 4.7U. Nano. Four point seven U and hundred nano. All right, and this is all just copied straight off of the data sheet at this point. All right, working our way down the chip. Uh, wow, really? D plus is there. Man, it's like, I get the sense like the symbol was created by key, like the, oh God, that's just, why would you, why would you do that? <laughs> why, why would you make the simple, the symbol D plus on the, oh God, breaks my brain. Okay, so we're gonna want a resistor. I don't know what this ref pin does, but they want 12K to ground. I know what the reset pin does and they want 1K to 
3.3 volts. We're going to shamelessly just drop fresh and like that. That's a bit silly. Um, I don't actually do it like that normally, but here we are. Um, that just happened. Component value 12K. This is probably some like current reference for the phase lock loop or something. Component value 1K. And this chip, this pin right here would let your like microcontroller run this through reset if we cared, but we don't. Okay, we don't have an EEPROM. We need an external oscillator. What kind of cheap ass chip is this? That's super frustrating. So, Professor. That's your values. They are calling out like 27 picofarad. And then crystal, this is going to have to be a um, 12 meg crystal, right? Yeah. Because pretty much every USB 2 device runs at 12 megahertz. Uh, ground here. Test pin's probably gonna go to ground. I'm gonna add a ground call out down here. And that's the end of that. And now we've kind of fell off the end of the application note. So I think that's all the support circuitry we need. Except that all their examples are showing So every single example they have in, uh, have in here is showing the external EEPROM, which is making me a little bit nervous because I'm afraid that they don't have enough internal EEPROM. I mean, that'd be crazy for it not to have enough internal EEPROM to... Uh, Be able to like just enumerate as a USB device itself. So EEPROM chip select cl clock select data IO connect. All right. So yeah, that talks to an EEPROM. I'm looking for tell me about this EEPROM. Functional description key features MPSSC interface block synchronous and asynchronous bit bang. Mode selection, EEPROM configuration. If an, if an external EEPROM is fitted, it can be programmed over USB using FT prog. The external EEPROM can also be used to customize the USB VID PID serial number production description strings and power descriptor value for OEM applications. If no EEPROM is connected, haha, -ha, the FT4232 uses its built in default VID, PID, product description, power description. Great. Yeah, so this is that's what I hoped. So um, if we don't wire up an EEPROM, the 4232 will enumerate as an FTDI 4232 
serial adapter that pulls, you know, I don't know, 100 milliamps or something. Um, if we were instead building this into a actual product, which well, in this case we actually are, but if we were designing design this into a serious product where it's got like a nice enclosure and you don't want people to have to know that you have an FTDI chip inside it, but you want them to plug it in and it shows up as, you know, my company's actual useful device thing. Um, you would add this EEPROM and get your own VID PID, which is like essentially like a MAC address, but for um, USB devices, you would get your own VID PID uh, and have your product description show up. So that way in like device manager it would show up as your thing and not FTDI's thing. But we don't need that, so we don't really care. So we're now interested in which lines are the TXRX lines. Which hopefully is gonna be some table for like A, B, C, yeah, this one. So pretty much we want those four pins and those four pins. Which are not so helpfully named over here, 80 bus zero through seven. So channel A, uh, is that was not the right table. All right, so here we go. All right, so all right, good night, Jeff. Um, so here on the table, we've got AD bus, BD bus, CD bus, DD bus, and it would appear that TX and RX are the first two lines on each one. So we're just going to want those. Uh oh, did I have the right symbol? It's got 63 pins on it. Sixty-four pins. So I'm hoping this is still right. Seems really embarrassing if I did all that, and it turns out that because LQFP and QFN packet. Okay, yeah. So the sixty-four ones have the same pin numbering. Great. So we are okay. And AD bus zero is still TX. So if I were to like take a label and drop it here, this is going to be um, S1 TXD PTL. And then we're going to need to edit that because the size is going to be too big. So we're going to want this to be more like 1.2. But we can copy that and drop it below it, and it doesn't overlap like that. Yeah, so that's what we're hoping for. Uh, edit. RxD. All right, that didn't work. Copy. And I guess this is actually gonna be a relatively simple schematic on this part because um, we don't need any flow control or anything. I'm not gonna implement any of that. But so, Yeah, so there's our first serial port, done. 
is going to be S2 TXD TTL S2 RXD S3 TXD S3 RXD S4 TXD S4 RXD. So there we go. Wires all around. Uh, what do we want to do with this power enable pin? Power enable. Active low power enable output. Active low power enable output. This can be used by external circuitry to power down logic when device is in USB suspend or has not been configured. Yeah, I don't care about that. Suspend. Active low when USB is in suspend mode. I really don't care about that. Yeah, so these two pins down here, this power enable and suspend pins, those would be used if um, we wanted this device to, when your host controller um, goes into some sort of suspend mode, um, power down all the circuitry on here. So, right, so if we really cared, we would take one of these and wire it to like a FET switching the 3.3 volt lines for all of our level translators, but we really don't care. Um, I wonder if we could get LEDs or something. Does that seem reasonable? Hmm, apparently it doesn't act. Uh, I guess that makes sense for a four port, but yeah, um, doesn't look like based on the data sheet, it doesn't look like it actually supports. Um, doesn't support any sort of like TXRX LEDs. So now, at this point, we're actually done working our way around, right? Because we're back to grounds. So we have duly considered all these other pins here, and we've decided that we don't actually want to attach anything to it. And so we, what we now want to do is we're coming back with the place do not, not place not connected flag, and um, drop that on each one of these pins that we know we aren't going to be using, because that indicates that we haven't forgotten to connect them and that they really are just not connected, which um, is nice because then when you run your electrical rules checks, um, if you legitimately have forgotten to connect something, it'll flag it for you. Granted, because of this stupid 1117 bug, we're never going to get a clean electrical rules check, but a guy can dream. So there's those. So now what we want to do is those need to get level translated here-ish to go to serial connectors. All right, and so now we want to find, oh, sorry about that. We want to find a uh, 3233. Oh. Isn't there? Um, I mean that there is a 3232. I don't happen to own it. I think it's a cleaner chip, though, right? I think I've used the 3232 more. And I think more importantly than anything else, it's here. 
because I'm lazy and I'd rather use stock parts than non-stock parts. Interface. So the Max 232, so the classic Max 323, uh, blah, blah, blah. Max 232 is there. Um, the 3232 is also there. The Max 3233 is not. And if I'm with the fancy that I'm going to be making more than one of these, what's the price difference? All right, and David's taking off as well. Uh, let's see, what time is it? 8.50. Uh, okay, cool. Um, it's not too late. Um, so we want to do a max 32.33 comparison for 10. Uh, big to small. Really? Six, 681. Max 232. All right, because we've got, because uh, we've got, we certainly at least have um, five volts. So there's no, I don't think there's any, di no, wait, 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 wait. No, 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 no. Um, because the, wait, wait, wait. So, um, I was gonna say there's no disadvantage to us using just a classic Jelly Bean 232, which is probably gonna be cheap as dirt, um, as we're about to see here. Yeah, right, so we're talking 94 cents versus seven bucks. Um, my concern was that, oh, wait a minute, we can't have a five volt part on here because the FT4232 is a 3.3 volt part. But I think if we come back up here and look in the features, yeah, right here, 1.8 volt chip, chip core, which means that the core of the chip runs at 1.8 volt, which is great because it means low power. 3.3 volt IO interfacing, 5 volt tolerant. Oh, but that's still not ideal because we're going to have a 5 volt F uh, max 232. Um, and we're going to try and be driving it with 3.3. Um, right, so we're, we're still, we're still kind of making some compromises here. Right, because the concern is... that the input logic high is going to be above three. Oh, no, 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 look at that. So going from the 4232 to the max 232, um, high level input voltage is two volts. So we're going to have plenty of headroom for the 4232 talking to the max. The max 232 can talk back to the 4232 because um, the inputs on the 4232 are five volt tolerant. Uh, so then the question is, do we use the two, three, uh, max 232 or the max 3232? Interface. I want 10 of something in stock. Give me the cheap ones. Preferably in an SO package, which I think is this like even the same pinout um, and for both. Yeah, that's a buck sixty nine. Right. It's not that I'm trying to cost optimize here. It's just that I don't need any extra features beyond what you get in the Max two three two. So I think we have now very carefully considered all of our options. And we're going to be using a max 232. Shut up. Look at that. Isn't that lovely? Oh.
All right, so then we just need to translate all these. Um, so there is technically a input versus output global tag symbol. Um, I hate all of them except for the, what is this? I think this is the input one. Yeah, like there's input, there's output, which has the arrow on the opposite side from the connector. There's the bi-directional one that makes it more of a hexagon. There's the tri-state, which I don't even know what that does, and passive, which makes it a box. Um, but I kind of like it more just as a graphical, here's a little flag. Um, so I just use input, quote unquote, uh, uh, global labels everywhere, just because that's kind of how I want the artwork to look, not because I'm trying to actually encode information in it. And I'm in charge because this is uh, my live stream. All right, there we go. We're gonna need some capacitors there. We're gonna need some more capacitors there. Brr. Getting a bit cramped for space here. Oh, I guess we don't actually need any more of that space there, do we? Nope. Brr. There we go. Oh no, you know what I forgot to do? I forgot to uh, set up What sort of page we're on? We're still on an A4 page. That does us no good. Oh, that's a little bit better. All right, so now we're on eight and a half by 11 page. Um, we've got a little bit more breathing room in the dimensions that I care about. America. So we've got those, they're powered up. We're gonna need to add the capacitors. And so what these capacitors are, um, let's pull up, let's see if we can find a uh, data sheet for this. Does that have a typical application circuit in it? Yeah, here we go. So the MAX232 is a super awesome chip. Um, because before the MAX-232 existed, when you wanted an RS-232 transceiver, you had to provide, you had to build and provide your own plus 12 volt and minus 12 volt power supplies. Um, right. And this is why, like, even today, uh, you're like, you know, um, ATC, uh, shoot. Uh, your motherboard, I don't the the 20 pin power connector, even today, those 20 pin power connectors have both a plus 12 and a minus 12 volt lines coming from your power supply onto your computer's motherboard is because the expectation was that you would need that minus 12 volt rail for your RS-232 transceivers. Um, I've, I've worked on some computer systems recently where we had to build this minus 12 volt voltage regulator to be standards compliant, but we knew that in the entire system, the only thing this minus 12 volt rail powered was the minus 12 volt rail good LED. But to be standards compliant, we, we had to have it, um, which was painful. But anyway, so the Max 232 was great because 
it has these two capacitors here, which are a switch capacitor charge pump. And so what you do is you ground one side and you fill the you charge the other side from five volts. You then disconnect the capacitor and you connect five volts to the negative side, and you have effectively 10 volts out of the top of it. You then shunt that charge over here to the VS plus capacitor, and which and it ends up being like eight and a half volts just because you know switching and stuff. Um, you have some fallout. But you have eight and a half volts that you've made by taking this five volts and stacking it on top of itself. And then you just uh, that you switch the C1 back and forth between ground and five volts, charging it and then discharging it um, really, really fast. And you pump up and produce this five, you know, eight and a half volts, which is higher than the five volts you put in. Um, then for C2, you connect. And I don't know if this is exactly how the 232 works. This is how these sorts of systems work. Um, you connect C2 minus to ground, and you charge C2 plus from VS plus. You then disconnect it, and you connect a VF, V2 plus to ground so that C2 minus is now at minus 8.5, right? So you've taken this 8.5 volts on VS plus, and you've filled a bucket with it and then moved it below itself, stacked it underneath itself. And that's how you produce a voltage below zero so that we end up with plus eight and a half and minus eight and a half, which is good enough then to run the transceivers here, the EIA-232 transceivers off of only one five volt rail, right? And this is great because I don't feel like building a three rail. I mean, we're already got a five volt rail and a 3.3 volt rail, and that's already pissing me off. But we now don't need to build two more voltage regulators to get us plus 12 or you know plus eight and a half and minus eight and a half, right? So that's that's why we love the max 232. But so we got that, we got that. Um, we then need the actual connectors. Um, hmm. So we want component libraries. I want to add in a component library I've got for the connector I want. What did I use that in? That was in some sort of like, uh, It was in some sort of little breakout board I made for something. You know what, it was in the library? Yeah. In here, I think I've got a 8P8C connector, which is the one that I happen to have in my junk drawer. Like that. Yeah, and so this is, I actually have, it's, Let's yeah. Let's sorry. I can I can actually show you. So let's stop screencasting, and let me go grab it. So this is one of the things when you're, around, when you're walking around at the flea market and you see a guy with a conceivably useful connector like a dual 8P8C um, and he's selling the entire tray of them for like 10, 10 bucks, five bucks, um, you just buy it, right? And so this is two 8P8Cs going straight to pins, which is kind of useful because a lot of the RJ45 connectors you'll see out there have the Ethernet method, Ethernet magnetics, which is like the transformers and the common mode chokes and stuff, um, built into it, which is great when you want to talk Ethernet. Not so great when I want to talk anything else over an 8P8C connector, which is a great connector. Um, and so. 
this was great because it, it's just awesome because now I have this dual connector, um, which encourages me to make even more complicated projects um, because it's a dual port and you know, that's the thing. Um, but so that I've got that and I finally figured out what, you know, I figured out the pinout for it and I got a footprint that maps to it. Um, and so all of that works out. All right. So going back to the screen, that was a long story that in the end says, all right, cool. We have this connector. Um, and this is going to probably be J2. I'm going to copy it down here. And that's going to be J3. J1, of course, being USB connector. All right. So we know they need to interconnect these with these per the Cisco pinout. Uh, again, one of these things that I probably could remember at one point off the top of my head, but this is no longer that time. Let's go pin out. <laughs> All right. So, plugging into the Cisco device, four and five are ground, which is what we care about. And three is TXD, four is RXD. All right, so let's first get that four and five are ground because that's, that's gonna matter. And this is where there's going to be no winning because the RJ45 mail. So pin three on the Cisco device is TXD, which means that what we would want to do is wire pin three here as RX. That's what we would want to do. If, we, if the only thing that we were ever doing with this was plugging this breakout board straight into Cisco devices using a straight Ethernet cable, we would want to do this. If we were instead always going to be using a rolled cable, which is what Cisco, I think Cisco likes to use, where pin one on one end of this AP, you know, RJ45 to RJ45 connector. The pin one on one side is connected to pin eight on the other side, right? And so it's like the the whole pin out just rolled over, right? So one goes to eight, two goes to seven, three goes to six, et cetera, et cetera. Um, we would want to wire this like this with the receive going to six. So to go from this jack here to a Cisco device, we would need to use a rolled cable and if we wanted to go from this jack here to a D, D sub serial port like on my servers, um, I would then be able to use this cable, a rollover cable. Yeah. Um, Yeah, so uh, Cisco uses a reverse pin out a rollover cable. Yes, right. I think that's right. Um, and so the the thing though is, I want to be able to use off the shelf Ethernet cables to connect this device to a Cisco device, right? And this is because I'm going to have lots and lots of Ethernet cables in this data rack. I'm not going to have any rolled cables. So I kind of don't want to wire it up like this. I also want to use off the shelf console serial cables 
uh, Cisco console cables like this one to plug this device into my uh, servers, which are standard x86 servers, and so which case I do want to wire them like this. So there is there is literally here no winning for what I want. There is there is no way that I can lay out this board that gives me exactly what I actually want um, as far as the pinout on this connector. So I could try and um, I could try and actually wire like two of them. I could figure, all right, I'm gonna need to talk to X number of Cisco devices and X number of desktop devices and you know wire them differently. But then it, you know, one port is magic versus the other one. Um, which I don't really want to do. And so we're actually going to how we're going to handle this is we're actually going to use some uh, of those little uh, 100 thou header and some jumpers to uh, make it so that I can actually switch this to either way I want it. So we're going to want a two by two. How are those male versus female? And these are now just ungendered. I don't know. We're going to use that one. So we're going to wire this up here. We're going to wire this to pin four and this to pin one. Just going to clean that up a little bit like that. We're then going to wire pin two to R one in and pin three. So T1 out. So now, depending on the pinout I want, you would install two jumpers between one and three and two and four if you want to wire it to speak uh, directly to a Cisco device. Or you would pull those jumpers out and rotate them and put the jumpers between one and two and three and four if you wanted this to be plugged into a server that's using a standard Cisco console cable to um, wire it into this console server, right? So we can now actually have the cake and eat it too. And we're just gonna clean up the routing a little bit on this one, like so. I think this is pretty clever. All right, as far as like ways to get around this whole no winning thing, I think that's pretty nice. And we're gonna call this a JP1 jumper one block. Copy that to, but oh, we're lining this up with the 6A. Wire that, wire that. Three goes to the transmit. Two goes to the receive. Boom. And really the value here is, this is like DTE selector, DC, DTT, DTE versus DCE select cross point, X over that's really what I'm doing here, right? So I'm, this jumper lets us make this either a straight through or a crossover without having to have any custom cables. So I think I'm gonna just call it I'm gonna just say that these jumpers are X over cables. And we're just going to go with it. Mm 
Mm -hmm. All right, so that's 219. Just obsessively trying to get these to all line up across the whole page. Like so. And then three is still transmit. like that. All right. Definitely didn't forget about those grounds. And then we are deliberately saying, I know that I'm not connecting these four other pins to anything. Like that. All right. And we definitely still have these capacitors over here to do. Those are, those are going to need to happen. And again, we're just going to have a ground pin down here. Nope, nope, that's not. We're gonna not, not connect those, we're going to wire that up. Like so. Then no connect these. All right, we just need those capacitors still. Looking at the MAX-232, they recommend one microfarad. I can do that. Value, one, U, go. Copy there. Copy there, copy there. There, 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 there. Like that. Like that. I am just going to be eating through one microfarad capacitors on this, aren't I? Like that, like that, like that, like that. I think that's actually um, at least as a first pass on it. I think that's actually the full schematic, right? So we've got a USB connector here, oh, which I guess we need to actually wire that up. So we've got USB in here. I guess there's no connect on the ID. Five volts in is going to go to the 3.3 volt regulator. And I think I'm going to find a new one because I don't think we need one amp of 3.3 volts here because it's just running the uh, 4232. 3.3 volt regulator for here. We've got filtering for the phase lock loop and the USB Phi, which is right. We've got a Voltage regulator here, which suspiciously doesn't have any capacitors on it. I think I need some capacitors on the 1.8 volt rail. So 
let's add a text note here to do cats. So I think we need capacitors on the 1.8 volt rail just to help out the voltage regulator. And that runs the V core. VCC IO is run off of the same 3.3 just because that's what we're limited to. Hopefully. This is all hardwired to keep running. We're deliberately not having an EEPROM on the USB adapter. We've got a crystal. We've got almost nothing used in each of the buses except for transmit and receive. We level shift those to um, RS-232. And one thing to notice here is that I could have just drawn lines across this, um, you know, point to point there. And I deliberately didn't not to save the, no the, the noise on the sheet, um, but just as a nice label, which I guess I actually probably, if I, with some effort, I could probably route all these wires straight over to make it real clear where it was going. Um, and then just use like net labels. Cause the main thing is I don't like the symbol, how it doesn't say TXR, but says 80 bus number. So there's probably a better way to have done this, but you know, we got what we got. We level shift them. We go through these cross point jumper blocks out onto the RJ45 connectors. I really think that's actually the whole schematic we got. Um, and it's now 930. So I think I'm pretty happy with the progress for day one. Uh, and so well, I guess we're going we're gonna to want to have to do mounting holes and then we'll design some sort of uh, din rail something that this will screw into <sighs> to just have probably just a raspberry pi on a dinner plate um, to control it and that'll be that so um, thanks everyone for watching. Uh, uh, thanks for the few people that ch chimed in on the uh, live stream chat. Otherwise, other than that, you're probably watching this not live. And I apologize for this being several hours long and us being lost in the wilderness for the first hour or two. Um, but thanks for watching. I think we're going to call it just about a night. And I shall see you later. So sure, let's see. Let's stop screencasting. All right. So thanks, guys. It was a laid back evening. I hope that everyone else was having a good time as well. And I shall see you later.